This is going to be another quick lesson. It's on food chains and food webs. And since we've already talked about trophic levels, it's going to be very, very simple. Um, although I hope you enjoy this meme of the crazy things that happen in Australian food webs and food chains. So a food web is just a bunch of food chains put together. Food webs are going to be more realistic than food chains because in general we tend to eat Organisms tend to eat more than one thing. There are some exceptions. For example, pandas tend to eat only bamboo, um, and uh, koalas tend to eat only eucalyptus. However, for the most part, most organisms tend to have more than one food source. A few rules of thumb, the arrow is always pointing in the direction that energy flows. So it's usually gonna, it's always gonna go from the one who is getting eaten to the one who is doing the eating. I tend to think of it as going into the mouth of, yeah, those are, those are crappy teeth, but whatever. Yeah, I tend to think of it as going into the mouth of the organism that's doing the eating. That's where the arrow is pointing. Um, and so a food web is a, a bunch of food chains stuck together that represent the fact that organisms eat more than one thing. There's more than one pathway for energy to take in an ecosystem. So here we have a food web that's in like near an aquatic ecosystem. Um, I cut off the top of the boy's head just so you could see this a little better. As we look at any producer, so we could start at the algae, and we can trace any of these arrows up into what would make a food chain. So for example, these blue arrows represent a single food chain, going from algae to daphnia, these took tiny little water flea things, to a gizzard shad, which is a type of fish, to a largemouth bass, which then gets eaten by a great blue heron. Um, we can also trace energy, all of this, um, these decomposers can then end up, like crayfish will end up eating decomposing materials, and then that can transfer, you know, to any of these places, including to humans. Uh, humans also catch some of these fish, so you could trace a food chain going from, say, the coontail to the pond snail to the green sunfish to the human. So there are a number of food chains you can take, and if you're trying to figure out what trophic level an organism is eating at, you trace their path back to a producer. So for example, let's say we're looking at the muskrat and we wanna find out what level of consumer it is. Well, we can look and see, okay, it eats, looks like it eats cattail. And so there is only one link from it to the producer. So it is going to be a primary consumer. And some of these organisms, depending on which pathway you take, might be secondary or tertiary consumers. Um, but usually uh, you'll, you'll be asked, it's not something so simplistic, you'll be asked more about what happens when you change things in a food web. So um, you have a complex series of interactions happening in a food web. Here's an example of a desert biome food web. And what we're gonna look at here is what happens when you affect the populations. So let's say some disease came in and ended up wiping out all of the star cactus. How would that impact the rest of the food web? Well, anything that eats it would tend to have a decrease in population. So kangaroo rats, as well as rabbits would have a decrease in population. Now, if there are less kangaroo rats, then anything that eats the kangaroo rat will also have a decrease in population. So that means that rattlesnakes, tarantulas, and hawks will also have a decrease in population. Anything that eats the rabbit will have a decrease in population, meaning the rattlesnake and the hawk, which are the top predators in this ecosystem. I know it looks like the bacteria are at the top, but notice they're eating from everything because they're decomposers. So removing an organism or changing the population of an organism can then have a wide impact in a food web. However, let's say that we do something different. Let's say that instead of increasing the populate or removing a producer, we're going to take out a predator. 
Okay, so let's say we take out hawks. They've been hunted, some sort of pollution is decreasing their population. What we can then say is every single one of their prey species will have at least some increase in population. Why? Because the hawks won't be around to eat them anymore. So hawks eat rabbits, kangaroo rats, and lizards. If those guys' population increase, well, let's look at what happens when a rabbit population or a kangaroo rat population increases. Well, there are more of these guys, so they're gonna eat more of the producers, which means the producer populations are going to decrease. That can affect the population of other consumers, like grasshoppers. Um, and so you see these wide ranging impacts. One of the things that we'll talk about uh, later on when we talk about like an endangered species is we'll talk about how if you um, have an, a, an organism that used to live in an area that gets kind of taken out by humans or hunting or habitat loss, it can have a profound impact on the ecosystem much larger than we thought originally would, would be the case. Also, you can have an invasive species. So for example, let's say that we have a, another type of grass or plant move in. You can have invasive producers. So let's say we have some sort of other grass species that moves in and it outcompetes the star cactus. If that happens, we'll see the same impacts. Anything that ate from it will probably decrease in population. You could have some of these consumers switching over to eating the invasive species, but they might not be adapted to be able to digest it. What if it has like thorns and the kangaroo rat may not be adapted to eat things with thorns? Because notice it's not eating the, the this cactus over here. So um, then you could see populations of herbivores decrease as their, their favorite or their um, more common, not prey species, but plant species they consume disappears. So uh, when you're looking at these, always try and look at what are the direct relationships to any organism whose population gets affected. So for example, if the tarantulas started having something impact their population, anything they eat, like the kangaroo rat, is going to be impacted and anything that eats them, like the rattlesnake or, well, not quite the bacteria, like the rattlesnake mostly, will be impacted as well. This is also why most organisms tend to eat more than one thing. Um, if the kangaroo rat loses its food source, the star cactus, uh, then what else is it gonna eat? That could mean it goes extinct if it loses its food species. However, if the kangaroo rat was capable of switching to say grass instead, then it might be able to survive if the star cactus species um, has, has some sort of disease or some other problem. So when you remove a species or you add a species to a food web, it's gonna affect the entire thing. Here are some examples. So let's say we have a pyramid of numbers of, we've got a number of trees, we've got some squirrels, and we've got a jaguar living there. It's, it's my food chain, don't judge me. Now, we have a volcanic eruption, and that volcanic eruption puts a lot of smoke into the air. Well, that is gonna decrease the amount of light that can come into the ecosystem. As you see by um, right here, this ray of, of light is much smaller than it would have been before the cloud. And then that decreases the number of producers, which then decreases the number of all the other organisms because without producers, you're not getting energy into the ecosystem. So a change in any sort of resource that affects the energy that's available in the ecosystem can also affect both the number of trophic levels. Notice we lost the jaguar. We lost our top, uh, our top consumer, our top predator. Um, and it can also affect the size of the trophic levels. We also had a decrease in the number of organisms at each level. You can also have just something that directly affects the, the producers. So for example, you can have human activity come in and we clear out a forest that is going to affect the uh, trophic levels in that area. For example, if we decrease the number of trees that could decrease the number of primary consumers, in this case squirrels. And then notice once again, we lost our top predators. So when you change the uh, number of producers in an ecosystem, that's gonna affect everything else. All right, that was it. It was a short one and we'll start unit two soon.